What's up, Pirate fans? Fall sports are in full swing on the campus of Seton Hall, which means we have a brand new season of Hall Talk. I'm Kevin Hubler, and I'll be joined by my panel shortly. There's been a lot going on in the world of athletics. We had both the men's and women's basketball schedules released this week, where the women have a tough start to the conference season on the road. The men get a considerably easier start compared to last year. Men's soccer's Andres Arcilla was named the Big East Offensive Player of the Week, and keeper Elliot Munford was the Freshman of the Week. Last time this happened, the Pirates just missed the conference tournament. Can they finally end the postseason drought? And volleyball is off to its best start since 2014, in which they made the NCAA tournament. Stick around. A brand new season of Hall Talk starts right now. Welcome back to this brand new edition of Hall Talk. We have a lot to talk about tonight, so we'll jump right on in. I'll introduce my panel now, Matthew Lamb, J.P. Pru. You guys are joining me now. We'll jump right in. The men's basketball schedule, as we mentioned, was released this week. It has a lot that we already knew about with the non-conference schedule, but the conference schedule considerably easier. What do you make of the solid non-conference, Matt? I think it's a great build for Seton Hall in this program, continually getting better every year in that non-conference schedule and getting some marquee names, Indiana in the Gavit games, Louisville, VCU, uh, Virginia or Vanderbilt, also uh, in Texas Tech and the Under Armour Union. It's going to be a great test for the Pirates early on. And to piggy off that, the game I'm highlighting the most has to be Rhode Island. Those Rams people are going to put under their radar. Now, I have a little experience covering the A-10, not to brag, but uh, I'll say the Rams are a really, really good team. So that's a game I'm circling over in Brooklyn. I mean, you look at that non-conference schedule and you see the toughness of that schedule. It's something that Coach Kevin Willard's been knocked on a lot in his uh, first six years here. But this year, a lot of these teams, three out of the first four games, are teams that were either in the NIT or in that NCAA tournament. Yes, and I like the schedule a lot. I mean, there's really nothing to complain about, which, you know, every year we'll find something, the three-game road trip last year. This one, we're starting off with two winnable games to start off, so at home. I like it. There's really nothing to complain about. Yeah, and of course, here are the two games at home, two on the road at Hingle Fieldhouse against Beller and then at Marquette. Could be some problems there, but for the Pirates, it's pretty favorable, you know, going into January. I really like the matchup at Monmouth, too, one of the first games of the season. That um, in-state matchup's going to be really great to watch. It's definitely been something that the fans have been asking for with the uh, non-conference schedule to finally put Monmouth on that schedule. They finally do it. We'll look at the, at the conference schedule that just came out this week. When you think about the way this conference schedule is uh, made out, last year they started out on the road. They had a three-game road trip where they went to Providence, and two days later they were back out at Villanova. Not an easy place to go to dunk or going down to the pavilion at the time. So, I mean, you think about the way uh, the Pirates are going to have to start this conference season. It's a lot easier than it was last year, Matt. It certainly is, and it really bodes well for Seton Hall. They want to get off to that fast start. You know, there was that stretch last year where they did lose a flurry of the games at the time, and you really had to claw your way back into that conference standings, into that you know, fourth seed, the Big East tournament, third seed. So what you want to do for the Hall is just make sure you get off on the right foot early. And getting off on the right foot is going to be important because think about that end of the season. They got two uh, home games. They finish up still with Butler. It seems like they always get Butler yeah. to end of the season. But you also have Villanova coming through the Prudential Center on the second to last game of the season. Yeah, that 8.30 at night, only game weeknight after 7 o'clock. But it's Villanova, so we will have fans there. There probably won't be any Wildcat fans there, so that'll help. And uh, those two games are big. But it's nice having Butler at home to end instead of at the road like mm -hmm. past season. Uh, past season, of course, that was a big game for the Pirates as it got them pretty much into the NCAA tournament at the time. We'll look now at the biggest surprise of the 2017 conference schedule, or not just the conference schedule, the, the schedule as a whole. What really caught your guys' uh, attention? I'm going to say having games on both Super Sunday and Valentine's Day. Now, the question here is, will our fans either go to uh, Philly, to Wells Fargo, which they may or may not, on Super Sunday, or will fans come out on Valentine's Day against Xavier? So it, I, I don't put up those holidays. It's certainly early enough, and yet I also think they have that uh, New Year's Eve game as well. Mm -hmm. Matt, what about you? I have to say it's, it's the amount of games in the tri-state area. They play at a Madison Square Garden against Texas Tech, two games at the Barclays Center, and then just again the flurry of games at home to start off the season, and going at Rutgers as well. It's another in-state close game. And you think about the way the conference schedule ended up 
playing out, it really bodes well for the Pirates. They do only have those two true road games that you have in the, uh, the non-conference season. Think about the way that uh, works out for the Pirates' favor. You have Louisville on the road. Uh, Coach Kevin Willard coached underneath, under uh, Rick Pitino down at Louisville when he was uh, with the Boston Celtics. You also got to think about the way uh, going to Rutgers, that's always a rivalry. Rutgers rebuilding as well. We'll move on now to men's soccer where, I mean, you think about the way they've been playing the last couple years. Certainly hasn't been a whole lot to talk about this year. Completely different story. Andres Arcilla, we mentioned, gets the uh, Big East Offensive Player of the Week. But it's not just that. It's the fact that they were coming into this week, they had a three-game win streak. They haven't had that since that 2014 season. Oh, it, it's been a while. I, I, <laughs> two years ago, not winning a game. But, God, let's get the confetti going already. <laughs> uh, but let's, let's lower our ex expectations still. Wins, get, get some wins, and we'll see where they go from here. But I like what I'm seeing so far. Yeah, Wednesday's loss against Delaware doesn't deter the way that they've been playing this past week. They've been simply firing all cylinders, and Arcilla was also the United uh, Coaches National D1 Soccer Player of the Week, and as you said, Elliot Munford doing some great things in goal. Neither of them played against Delaware yesterday. That could have been a reason for the loss. And you think about the way the Pirates end up playing. They like to play up-tempo offensive. Mm -hmm. Having Andres Arcilla back, that's certainly a help for them. But they've had a couple other guys up at the front as well. I mean, you think of Jonathan Jimenez, he's up there. Uh, they got the new kid, a uh, couple new guys up there at the mm -hmm. front as well that really have been uh, helping the offensive pressure. The Pirates are at the top in the uh, stats, in offensive stats and assists, and shots uh, fired at the net. What are you guys making of the offensive pressure that they've been able to show this year that we haven't really seen in the past couple of years under Jerson Esprey? I think it's really been something that's been helping the Pirates. You know, they're getting continually better year after year now, four wins last year, and they, they really haven't been playing you know too well in the past couple seasons. But I think one person that's really been doing the bulk of the work is Spencer Burkhardt. Not really seeing it in the points, only five total points on the season, but continuing to facilitate the offense. And you have Mark Nevis, Mario Prada, of course Jimenez and Arcella, all you know, playing key factors. And to piggy off that, I mean, it, it, I'm going to be very simple here. If you don't put the ball in the back of the net, you can't win. Mm -hmm. So as long as they keep the pressure going, keep the, the midfielders and the forwards in it, they will compete and maybe win a couple more games. So I'm just going to be as simple as we can be put the ball in the back of the net. Yeah, the defense has been pretty good throughout Pangonis. has been a stud on the back line, but you, know, you need to put the ball in the back of the net yep. to win some games. And thinking about, let's think about this for a second. The Pirates haven't played well in the uh, conference season lately. They have, uh, they start this week with St. John's at home, but there's a lot, there's a couple ranked teams. What do you guys have uh, quickly for your expectations for the conference season? Well, right now, I'm going to still be low. I Hey, if they can finish outside the bottom three, I will again, Confetti going there. I'll run around South Orange Avenue going, we won some games, y'all. So that that's what I'm going to keep it low so they can surprise us. The team hasn't won more than three conference games since 2006, and they've only really done that twice in the past 10 years. So two wins, I think, is reasonable for the whole. They have certainly potential to do it. If any year to do it, it is now. And Georgetown is the only ranked team this year in the Big East at number eight overall in the nation. So you think about now, we'll move forward to uh, another hot team, and that's volleyball. Uh, they're really off to their best start since 2014. They're at six and four. They just dropped a match to Hofstra the other night, but Abby Thielen's been leading the way for this team, red hot all the way through. She's had two back-to-back uh, -back, uh, Big East honor roll uh, nominations. So you think about the way they've been playing, what do you make of the hot start that this more experienced team has over last year? I, I would like to point out, for just watching them play, they communicate a lot more from a season ago. They just feel like more of a team, more of a team. We're going to point out Abby Thielen, but just the whole team is a lot better, and I'm liking them, and, and they're just being a really good team right now. Yeah, I certainly think that veteran leadership coming up the ranks, you know, that junior class has certainly done a lot in order to make this team a lot better. Sophia Coffey, double-double machine with six more already on the year. Thielen not only leading the team in total kills, she's led the team in kills in every match this season, been the, the high killer for this offense. Her swings look so much better since coming in as a freshman, and I think Sheree Barnes has been another great player, graduate, uh, transfer from Kentucky, doing some great things uh, for that part offense. Yeah, JP, you talk about the leadership. Sheree Barnes absolutely showing that leadership. We saw it happen a few weeks ago uh, in the matches in uh, Walsh Gym during the Seton Hall Classic. She certainly showed the leadership that you expect from a graduate. Looking at Abby Thielen, though, you have to, cons you have to look at it and say, she does it all on the floor. She's uh, been almost every position on the floor in her time here at Seton Hall, uh, learning a new position every year. She's second in uh, the conference in total points, leads the conference in total kills. What do you make of her breakout junior year? Well, I gotta say, you honestly can't stop her, and the velocity is 
way up. I saw her start of this year going, that is not the same person. That's like going to 70, 80 miles an hour. Like, I'm not getting in front of that anything. And hey, if she can win libero too, that would be kind of fun. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see that happening. Matt, what do you make of Abby Thielen's uh, success so far? I think it's just been from great team communication. I mean, certainly losing some key pieces last year, like Tessa, Fournier, and Danny Shorter, but you know, Sarah kind of makes a great job coming up as libero, the leader now on that defense, Dominique Mason, again, another great offensive player. It takes a little bit of pressure off of Abby Thielen, just let her continue to come into form and become a really dangerous player. I hate to put a bit of a down on this hot start for the Pirates uh, season, start to the season, but you have to also consider that they are towards the bottom of the league when it comes to overall statistics as a team. Uh, there's so many good volleyball teams in the Big East. What do you guys have uh, for your expectations for their conference season that starts next week, but what do they have to change this week uh, in their final non-conference tune-up to get set for that, uh, that conference season? Yeah, I think it continues just to be that, that team chemistry and communication building up. They exceed expectations every single year. They were not supposed to make the NCAA tournament in 2014, but look at how they did. They finished above the preseason coaches poll every year since then. I think they're going to continue to do that, possibly may even grab that final fourth Big East spot in the Big East tournament. Yeah, and to pick off that, they always outperform. It's, it's something that, that Coach Yeager always has. They always play mm -hmm. higher than their level of play. And if they were able to make it a season ago in that last fourth spot, I think they can, can again. I mean, Creighton, they're a top ten team, so mm -hmm. it's... Providence is 11-0 to start the yeah, season, too. Yeah, too. So there are some tough teams, but I think they can pull up that fourth spot. We'll throw one more thing in here. Where do you see the way that the Pirates are going? Uh, who needs to step up in addition to Abby Thielen? Because as Abby Thielen goes, it seems like that's the way the team goes. But who needs to step up to help her out? I'm going to go with Sophia Coffey. She seems like someone that always, when she's in the game, the team wins. Mm -hmm. And if she has a little bit of a down game, the team loses. So I'm going to go with her. I don't know if that's the same I mean, idea for that. She's, she makes teammates better. Um, yep. I think she's certainly a key piece. I think Sarah Kennaway can do something you know, for this team that helps out. You know, it's so hard to replace Tessa Fournier, but if you continue to do the same level of competition that she's had, then the Pirates are going to be looking a lot better. That's going to do it for us here on uh, Hall Talk. I'll thank my panel, JP and Matt Lamb. Thank you for joining me. you got to have a lot of action going on in Seton Hall sports this weekend. majority of the fall sports are in action, so make sure you follow along at SetonHallPirates.com. Uh, we'll make sure that you'll have all the info you need. And also make sure you stay tuned here to Hall Talk throughout the season as we bring you everything you need to know on Seton Hall Athletics every Thursday uh, here on Hall Talk.